Pierre, are you ready? Yeah. MJ, are you ready? Need a little bit more time. Standing by? <laughs> MJ, are you ready now? <laughs> yeah, that, that'll do it. Got you back. Coming down in three. Hello, folks, and welcome to Got Your Back, NHL edition, LeBron and Rashog. And MJ today, yes, Mystic Mike Johnson, joining us once again on the podcast after a week-long hiatus last week. Glad to have him. Uh, Going to go around the horn in the National Hockey League, some real tight playoff races. Man, it's coming right down to the wire for a few of these teams, isn't it? Uh, great podcast plan today as well. Bane Pettinger. And Brock McGillis uh, of the Alphabet Sports Collective. Bain, of course, a prominent uh, NHL player agent around the National Hockey League. Brock McGillis. Uh, we all know the platform that he has in the game as uh, a player that has come out and uh, been a huge factor in the conversation for the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, the NHL's Pride Nights have in large part wrapped up. Wanted to have them on the podcast to discuss what they saw some of the positives, some of the negatives, and how the whole situation can be better. That's coming up in segment number two of today's pod, but first, tons of National Hockey League talk. And a reminder, got your back, NHL edition, brought to you by Cross Country Canada Supplies and Rentals, where they do absolutely everything when it comes to the Canadian construction industry. If you want to build a road, they've got what you need, from survey equipment to plan it all out to the Equipment to haul and move dirt, even the material you need to lay down and stabilize the terrain. Whatever you need, if it's a big construction project, Cross Country Canada Supplies and Rentals totally has you covered. They've got that get-her-done formula that they live by and uh, a great Canadian company founded by Canadians, run by Canadians, Cross Country Canada Supplies and Rentals, title sponsor here on Got Your Back. As we welcome in Johnny and uh, Pierre Lebrun, a little piece of sound for you, Johnny, just to pump up the confidence this morning. Do you believe in uh, coincidence, science, superstition? Eight of ten goals on TSN. Are you a TSN viewer? Do you enjoy watching TSN? I think it's the guy between the bench. Who's that, Mike Johnson? Yes. Yeah, he's got to be there every game, so I'll let him know. Let's see what we can do for the playoffs. Zach, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello. Wait, but wait one second. See, you say confidence booster. He's like, what did he say? That guy between the bench and who is that? Like he doesn't know my name? Oh, so you're, you're more dinner. upset. Yes. You're more upset he didn't have your name right on the tip of his tongue. How That's what you take out of that. On my name. I'm there every time. Wow. He watches TV, watches TSN. Zach, wow. we're going to have a talk next game. And I don't know why. That's the last game I'm between the benches with him. So I don't know if he scores again this year. I'm just saying, you, you know, you got to have me right there available to him. Maybe a little reminder of how many goals Mike Johnson scored. I NHL. mean, Maybe you know, in that mean. very building, I probably have more than Zach Aston Reese. So yes, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was that was that was nice. That was funny. <laughs> He's actually a very good interview. He got me chuckling there for sure. For sure, I'm not sure what Mark Masters is going to be able to do for the playoffs, though, because unless he can magically switch the NHL playoff rights over to TSN, I feel like he's <laughs> not going to have Mike Johnson between the benches to rely on anymore. Listen, the Leafs have a lot of sway. You never know. <laughs> they put me on the payroll. They need a big goal. All of a sudden, I'm down in Tampa sitting right behind the bench. That would be amazing. <laughs> uh, yes. We have a mildly frustrated Pierre Lebrun with us today, Johnny. I'm sensing mm -hmm. a bit of an edge from him. An edge really? that can only be a result of frustrating traffic. Pierre, oh. you've got that sense about you. Yeah, but no one at home cares about our Toronto traffic. Uh, yeah, MJ and I were talking <laughs> offline about it. Oh, my goodness. I was driving the kids to school. It, it, I've lived here since 1995, so 28 years now. It's got to be at an all-time worst right now, the traffic in this city. It, it's just ridiculous, wow. honestly. I mean, enough. you want to be the urban sombrero wearing downtown guy. You're right in the yeah. thick of it. Like, spread yeah. out a little bit. Like, yeah. I'm I'm in the city, but I got, listen, I got my kids I will this summer. in no time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah summertime Soon he heads enough, for the yeah. hills in the Soon summer enough. yeah yes. absolutely no i'm out in the even in edmonton like i'm out uh you know 10 15 minutes out of town here in sherwood park makes all the difference in the world um uh, okay guys lots of uh playoff chatter to get to here playoff races uh tons of stuff to get to on the docket today so let's just dive right into the breakdown that of course brought to you by our friends at kuma outdoor gear they've got a wide range of gear to fit all your outdoor needs tents and sleeping bags travel games pet products drinkware 
and they are some kind of fired up about their new switchback heated chair. The world's first heated chair powered by Bluetooth technology. I've got one sitting over there. That's amazing. As I told you guys last week, I have one. It's been awesome. I actually sat in it last night uh, and watched some of the Euler game in my switchback heated chair from Kuma. And I was just mucking around on my phone, turning it up and down, the heat up and down on the Bluetooth. It's so cool. I can't wait to throw it out back by the fire pit mm -hmm. and turn it on while I'm inside and go out and sit next, sit on a nice the, heated chair. The things you will do for our sponsors. I mean, I got to be careful who you pick as sponsors. I mean, you'll do anything for a sponsor, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, like I think Ray and Dregs have Canadian Club whiskey. Uh, you know, <laughs> my, my testimonial will be me just, you know, stammering around the opening every morning on the no, i'm kidding uh anyways kuma outdoor gear uh they're available at different outlets all across uh the country so by all means check them out online and you can see where you can pick up their stuff but it's great camping outdoor gear that is kuma outdoor gear uh let's start with the calgary flames gentlemen so there's a monster of a game tonight calgary and winnipeg but boy, the Flames have to, they're going to have to regroup quickly here because Johnny, last night, the Chicago Blackhawks of all teams uh, roll into town and it's a 4-3 loss. The Flames absolutely choke one up to a bottom feeder of a team. They've lost all three games this year against Chicago on a tough night for Kadri. Man, you just can't lose that game when you're in the position they're in. No. That one stings. That one hurts. I mean, they're so close, you know, effectively tied two points back. Now they played one more game than Winnipeg. The numbers, if they lose tonight, the numbers are virtually done. I mean, yeah. it's, it's almost impossible. So it all comes down to tonight. But it shouldn't have had to all come down to tonight. And what is frustrating is that last night might have been the season in a nutshell. Like they have, you know, Nazem Kadri is a fantastic player. Make no mistake. I think everybody wants him on their team. But, you know, a big name player that they went out and got to play in games like this to be a difference maker, had a really tough night. Really tough night. Turnovers, kind of careless with pucks and soft on pucks, and they went back in their own net. Um, you know, like that sort of has happened all year long, Pierre, where the, just the guys they were counting on to make them great just haven't done it often enough. Uh, and it they're very likely to miss the playoffs because of it really is, to me, one of the great surprises of this NHL season. I mean, I say surprise. Obviously, you weren't 100% sure how they would rebound from losing two-thirds of one of the most dynamic lines in hockey and Johnny Goudreau going to Columbus and Matthew Kachuk forcing a trade to Florida. But still, we love the way Brad Cheerleading reacted, right? As In general, all the media. I mean, mm -hmm. we love the fact that he found a way to get Huberto and Uyghur and sign Nazem Kadri, and we kind of looked at this team and said, all right, let's – put the band back together and this is a team that won the Pacific division last year in the regular season. But, you know, even though they started playing better over the last couple of weeks, it, it's never really come together for them this season where you really looked at them and said, okay, they've arrived. This is a team that's going to be a pain in the ass if they get in. I mean, I think if they somehow get in, despite all their, <laughs> all, all their best efforts not to, they could still be a pain, but, I thought last night that's the loss where you're like, you can't do that. You cannot yeah. lose at home to the Blackhawks and think you still deserve a chance to get in. And, uh, you know, they might prove me wrong with a big win in Winnipeg tonight, but it's just, it's just not been there for this Flames team all year. And if they miss the playoffs, some big questions looming, yeah. guys. Brad Trillian's What gives, though, Pierre? Is up. What gives if they do miss? Like, just, like, well, Brad Trillian's all the contract players. is up. Yeah, all the players right. are signed forever, but the GM's contract's up, and Daryl Sutter's mm -hmm. you know has a contract. But you know, there's always, I guess, a question marks about coaches when this happens. A mm -hmm. couple more years, new contract kicking yeah. in there. Two year extension for Sutter kicks in in September. Um, and, and the tree living thing, I mean, I touched on this in a piece a couple of weeks ago. Is, is actually, I don't 100 percent know all all of what's transpired, but I can tell you this: it's not like ownership hasn't gone to tree living when Sutter got extended in the fall ownership also talked to tree living about an extension. It just right. didn't happen. And I don't quite know why. So just be careful not to think that, Oh, well, we're not signing the GM. I think they tried to sign him and it didn't happen. And now as we get close to the end of the season here, we'll see if they get in or not. Obviously another conversation looming between ownership and tree living, but, and this is just me. And I want to be careful in pointing this out. It's just me trying to read the tea leaves. 
I'm not sure that it's just about, well, will they make him another offer? I think you also ask yourself the question, does Brad Tree Living, does he want is this you know, nine to... years now? So is this still the gig that he wants? Probably, but I, I do want to put that out there. Guys, when we talk about Kyle Dubas, and we have lots, the idea is if for whatever reason he's not retained in Toronto, he'll be working again immediately in the NHL. What's the outlook for Brad Tree living in that similar scenario where there isn't a return to Calgary, Pierre? Is he, is he a guy that lands right back in the league right away? How is he revered out and about I mean, there? There, might be, there might be a year where, like you see with other GMs, where, where, you're, uh, where you're a consultant for one of the guys that you're close yeah. to in the league. And then you bounce back. I think he's well liked. He's well respected. The Flames are pretty much been in the thick of it almost every year. He's aggressive, which I like. You know, one of the things that I think uh, sometimes some of the younger GMs sit on their hands too much and are, are worried about making moves that will backfire. Brad Trielding, not one of those guys, has made a lot of moves. They've not he's all made panned some out. Big trades. Yeah, they've not all panned out. But I think that's what you want in a GM. So I could definitely, you know, if he doesn't sign an extension in Calgary. I think eventually he'll he'll resurface. But who knows? May end up continuing his journey in Calgary here. We'll see how it plays out. Uh, the other side of that game last night, the Chicago Blackhawks hurt their chances in the Bedard sweepstakes. And I don't know if you saw Bedard last night in a loss to Saskatoon, but was absolutely lights out. So Anaheim, Columbus, Chicago all have 56 points in 77 games. The sweepstakes continue. Johnny, where do you think the National Hockey League would like Connor Bedard to land? This mm. is an interesting question to me because you can look at it one of two ways. He could go to a market that needs a boost. So yeah. that would might be like a smaller market, maybe like not one of the premier markets, like a, like an Anaheim or a Columbus, um, San Jose. Like those teams could use a star and, and help them grow and become bigger. Or, so that's like bringing up the floor. Or you can go to a big market. Chicago, Montreal, and push up the ceiling. If I'm running the NHL, I don't want to dis diminish the smaller markets, but I want my biggest stars in the biggest markets. And what drives revenue is the biggest market teams. And so whether it's Chicago or Montreal, probably Chicago because they kind of need a rebirth. They, want, they need Patrick Kane from, from 20 years ago. They need that guy again. And Connor Bedard would be that guy for that team in that market. I think if I'm the NHL, if I'm the if I'm Gary Bettman for the day, I'd hopefully have him land in Chicago or Montreal, and what not in forty six hundred seat Mullet Arena, Pierre. Well, if you want a new <laughs> rink built, maybe. Yeah. Well, I mean, I got recency bias. I sat down with Yarmo Kekalainen yesterday before the game in Toronto. I got a piece coming up Thursday in the Athletic, and okay. we covered a lot of different ground. You know, Yarmo's been around a long time now. By the way, he's considered the pickleball king. Of NHL He's team. a racket sport enthusiast. Yeah. Very good at tennis. Yeah, yeah, yeah so all those man. things. Yeah. Guys, he's taking care of himself too. He looks physically yeah. formidable yes. still at his age. Yeah. That should be that should be a good hint for me what I should be doing. Um, but the look on Keiko Landon's face when we talked about the lottery and, and Connor Bedard uh, didn't even have to say a word. I mean, what it would mean for the Blue Jackets who, as he reminded me, have actually never drafted first overall. Uh, since they've been in the league. Um, they've watched him a ton, obviously. Um, and he admitted that it's something that I had heard on trade deadline day, that when we did the mock draft lottery, uh, with Jeff O'Neill playing the role of uh, Bill Daly, <laughs> Kate Linden admitted that in the war room in Columbus, that the Blue Jackets let out a cheer when the Blue Jackets did win the TSN mock draft lottery on March 3rd. So, so oh uh, you know, hoping that it's good karma for May 8th when the real thing happens. I, listen, I, I, you can make the argument for all the teams that MJ mentioned. You know, Columbus, not only... I can't, so Pierre. What's Ujo. best, for, like, what's best yeah. for Columbus is obvious. But yeah. him in Columbus is not best for the NHL. Respectfully to Columbus. That's not best for the NHL. They go on to win a whole bunch of cups because of it. I don't know. And then it becomes an it market. I, not, I don't believe. Wouldn't it be better if you won a whole bunch of cups in Chicago or Montreal? Like, let's be honest here. Yeah. Like, that's the reality. That's like saying, oh, it's better for a star to play for the Yankees as opposed to Kansas City. I'm not diminishing Kansas City. The Yankees are the Yankees. The Cowboys are the Cowboys. Like, it's just different. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, so Montreal Canadiens <laughs> versus Columbus. Like, Columbus deserves to want him, but make no mistake, it's not better for the league if right. he lands in Columbus. But the point I was going to make, and, and you can make a similar point about Anaheim, was just the on ice point that in Columbus, not only already have Johnny Goudreau and Patrick Liney, they're guys that 
you know, Connor Bedard can play with. But uh, mm-hmm. Real Marchenko is having a really good under the radar rookie season in the NHL. Um, Ken Johnson's really come on. So there's some pieces there that are already sitting there mm-hmm. in terms of who you could play with right, or right out of the gates. Again, you could say the same about the Ducks, right? With their young talent up front. Um, so I was thinking more of the hockey part, MJ, not mm-hmm. so much the... Quizmaster last night on TSN threw out the interesting one. Bedard and McDavid, line mates in 25. Uh, but the world any, entirely possible. You think it's Paul? You think Bedard can make enough of an impact early on that yeah. uh, he can find his way onto that line? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, you give him a, give him a, a couple of years in the NHL yeah. to show that he can score 40 or 45, whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I would not say never at all. For, like, and then I don't know how hard it's supposed to score in the playoffs in the WHL, but like he's putting up like three or four or five points a game against the top seeded Saskatoon team. I mean, yeah, it's, I, it's funny when you say Columbus has watched him a lot. I'm like, do you even need to watch him at this point? Like, what are you watching? <laughs> well, yeah. Like, you know, like Stop watching. We're not watching his games anymore. If we have the chance, Save your we're money. taking them. Yeah. Start focusing yeah. on your second round pick. <laughs> They have one of their prospects uh, on the Pats as well, so they they, they watch a lot of games. But um, the other thing Kegel and said, by the way, which is you know it's so hard to find different things to say about Connor Bedard, but one of the things that he said is that he veered into a Sidney Crosby conversation. He was talking about Bedard, about what he believes from what he can tell so far of Connor Bedard that there's this self drive of wanting that nothing is good enough that there's going to be this desire every year to get better in all these different areas, which obviously has been the hallmark of Sidney Crosby's career. And, and that's when Keiko Lennon's face really lit up is that he, you know, there's superstars and then there's superstars who are never satisfied. And he sees that in Connor Bedard. I thought it was an interesting comment. Didn't want to be traded, right? Could have gone places that would have guaranteed him a bigger stage potentially through the playoffs, wanted to stick with his team, and here they are in the playoffs, and he's doing everything he can to get them as far as he can, but he wanted to stay with his teammates rather than being moved on. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I respected that decision, man. I, I can understand why he wouldn't want to be watching his team in the playoffs right now as he's wearing a different sweater. So, Well, if he would have been traded, they wouldn't have made the playoffs for starters. But anyway. Well, yeah. Good point and, by you. And I'm not, look, I'm not looking for him to lose. But if he does, can he play for the World Championship Canadian team? I'm just saying. <laughs> ah, Johnny. <laughs> selfishly. When's your flight, buddy? Yeah. Doug Armstrong on line one. Imagine yeah. that. Well, we've Steve seen. Steve on line two. You know, I remember a year Jonathan Taves was over there. I've covered yeah. that enough. When those young players come, it's definitely an interesting uh, kind of first look yeah, Austin at the Matthews. high-end game. Yeah, I think Austin Matthews yep. played in a men's world before his NHL career began. It, last thing on Bedard, I don't know if you guys think about this all the time, but when Canada won the World Juniors, and he was one of the post-game interviews on TSN, and one of the questions was about him winning MVP, and he immediately shut that down. Yes. He had no interest in talking about himself, even mm-hmm. though, let's be honest, looking back in time, every Canadian junior fan is going to remember, you know, of course. performance as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, Kenzie did a good job with the question, but his answer was was telling in that he was yeah. just not about himself in that moment. And and again, an, another good sign. Okay, uh, let's move on to the Florida Panthers. 2-1 win over the Buffalo Sabres. How about Kachuk? Disrupts in the corner, creating havoc. Heads to the crease, tips in the goal. Just a classic Kachuk moment. The guy continues to propel this team forward. Uh, they are now in the first wild card spot. They've won four in a row. Meanwhile, the Pittsburgh Penguins end up losing 5 1 to the New Jersey Devils. So, Johnny, like Matthew Kachuk in the Hart Trophy conversation in terms yeah. of value to his team, we know Connor McDavid is going to win this thing. But he does what he does last night. If the sure? Florida Panthers make the playoffs, <laughs> like, He's. You, you wonder if he isn't right up there in terms of voting in and around that second place. We'll talk about that in a minute. But just a thought on what Florida is doing here in Kachuk to get him there. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've taken a long time to sort of creep their way in. And, you know, they're going to end up with 93, 94 points, a far cry from last year, but still decent. Um, they're being helped by Pittsburgh and the Islanders, not really playing great down the stretch either, allow themselves to get in the playoffs. But now they're in a great spot, and it is – Largely driven by Matthew Kachuk and Alex Lyon. Who? Who the heck is Alex Lyon? I was playing, just going to mention him. Playing He's important games it. for yeah. Florida with Spencer Knight not available. Um, yeah, I mean, I think at this point you, you figure they probably will make it. Uh, they play late in the year against Carolina and Toronto, two teams might, who might be playing for nothing at that point. So maybe that will help them as well. And as far as Matthew Kachuk, he is 
He's a hard finalist for me. We can talk about, I mean, McDavid's going to win it. I'm giving Matthew Kachuk one of the three spots, and we can have a conversation about Leon, about Nathan McKinnon, uh, about Jason Robertson, about Pasternak, about Kucherov. Yeah. Carlson, maybe? No. No. No Carlson, no Olmark. I don't want to hear any of those conversations. It's already a okay. crowded field already, but... I mean, it's amazing what he has done down in Florida. Everything they could have possibly hoped when they brought him in. Well, and I wonder if the Panthers getting in or not getting in, how many votes that will either boost him or cost him, right? Yeah, it'll I boost. Think a lot of the voters yeah. look at that, and which is part of it. I mean, the point of being an MVP is boosting your team to another place. Um, you mentioned Alex Lyon. I was just looking up some of his stats there while before you mentioned him, MJ. 30 years old. A lot of his career spent in, in the AHL. I, I happened to chat with him last week when the Panthers were in Toronto. Now, remember, when the Panthers got to Toronto, they had just lost in Ottawa. Uh, they had lost four in a row. Um, Bobrovsky uh, ends up getting sick, I think, before the game mm-hmm. in Toronto. And so they go to Alex Lyon. Now, Alex Lyon couldn't come out and tell us because uh, I think the Pan- Paul Maurice wanted to be a game-time decision. So they couldn't announce it. But it was the morning of the skate. And, and Alex Lyon, literally, I'm talking to him. He's like... I think I'm playing tonight. He was so excited about, <laughs> about going in and Toronto and the team needing him. And you could tell from his attitude, it was all about cherishing what, you know, a lot of people might be scared of that opportunity. Maybe, I don't know. He was like, all right, let's go. I'm excited. And here he is, four in a row. He's won his last four games. Good for him. Yeah. Along the lines of the Hart Trophy conversation, uh, should this be the year where teammates finish one and two in voting, it'd be the first time since seventy seventy one, mm. or in Esposito. And of course, there's that age old debate about the language of most valuable to the team, and if you can have two yeah. players on one team and get votes, and that sort of strange, I don't know, how valuable argument can that they people, be? It, yeah, if they how both val- are that valuable? Exactly. Right. But look at what Leon Drysaddle is doing this year, you guys. It's it's ridiculous, and I yeah. I watch him every game. I cover the Oilers. Uh, it feels to me like if there were ever a year for guys to be one and two on the same team, this might be the year, Johnny. Yeah, I mean, you can make a pretty easy argument, really. And, and I think what Leon has done with how well... I mean, first of all, Edmonton's playing the last like three months of the year. They're the best team in the league. Best, second, yeah, they are. Like, yeah. They, yeah. Since you know, they lost to LA, uh, their winning percentage is is best in the league. Better they've than been, Boston. They've been unbelievable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, five in not, a row here. Like, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. not like they're kind of scraping in. I mean, he's helping them to being one of the best teams in the league. A big, and like, you know, we can talk about the power play versus five on five, but a big part of the reason why the power play is as great as it is, as he's approaching all time records for most power play goals in a season, yep. is because Leon Dreisand is so good at it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that, like that's part of the game, too. Um, I think what he has done with his great run here lately and the number he's putting up and the, the, the gap between him and Kucherov is he's jumped ahead of Kucherov, clearly. I think he's jumped ahead of Pasternak, clearly. I think now it's Drysaddle, McKinnon, Kachuk. Those are the three other guys. And I, so, um, you know, if you're going to finish 25 points ahead of the next guy on a better team, on a record-breaking power play, Pierre, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's a pretty easy argument to make. Yeah, it is. I suspect that it will probably hurt Dreisaitl that of course. plays on a team with the guy who's going to win it. <laughs> yeah. Just just knowing how the voting has gone over the years. And I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but I wonder how it's hurt Jagger over the years playing with Mario, Malkin over the years, or vice versa, playing with Sid. Mm. I, I just think that's the pattern that we've seen over the years, right? Uh, um, and I totally agree that he's having one of the top five seasons, if not top three seasons in the entire league right now. But I think the voters from the, from the Writers Association will look at the definition and say who is the one player that has pushed this team the most, and it'll probably probably hurt Dreisaitl. I hope not. Quick thought on the Oilers. So twice in the last week, they've beat the LA Kings. Hey, that game beat- last night, Shoggy. Oh, man. So they're likely to play in the first round. Yeah. And I always wonder, like, at this time oh. of the year, when guys play each other, like, is it going to be – let's just forget it and get to the playoffs yeah. or it's going to be, let's let them know what's coming in the playoffs. Last night felt a lot more like let's let, like every whistle scrum and pushing and shoving that guy, that, that yeah. it was a precursor to a chippy playoff game. 
20 hits for the Oilers in the first period. I think they ended up they ended up with a pile of hits at the end of that game. Lots of nasty stuff, lots of sticks. Dry saddles right in the middle of a bunch of it. So it's the skilled players that are getting into it too. You'll remember in the last game, McDavid had to hit on Mikey Anderson, who's still not back playing. There is an undercurrent here of nastiness. Five shots on net in the first period. 3-2 LA in the first period last night, you guys, Pierre. Like, talk about having to grind out a win. This high-scoring Oiler team is showing they can do it however you want to do it. And by the way, the Kings have scored a lot of goals this year, too. They have. Which I don't think they get credit for. Like, they really – they're not the same Kings team of a year ago, right? Uh, they've, they've gone to another level, too. But, yeah, no, no team has been more impressive than Edmonton. And, and you know, I don't think the Kings want the Oilers in the first round. I don't think the Oilers want the Kings. <laughs> So, and that's no disrespect to Vegas, who may win the Pacific, but I feel like either team would rather play Vegas, which is a strange thing to say. But, you know, they're probably looking at what's happening in goal there and, and maybe seeing an edge. But, yeah, Oilers Kings in the first round feels as daunting in terms of a great team going home as Devils, Rangers, and Leafs Lightning, right? Yep. All these first round two, three matchups, you know, you could have a Colorado, Minnesota. I mean that's uh, that's crazy. What a first mm-hmm. round we're we're in line for here. Oilers, uh, the the Kings actually do a pretty good job against Connor McDavid. He do- doesn't seem to run roughshod with them the way he does Phil against Deneau. a lot Deneau of other teams. Phil is a good player. Phil up yeah, Deneau. Phil Deneau for sure. And and listen, the the analytics would show that McDavid's still tilting the ice, you know, at even strength when he's. But it's all about you know total points and what does he actually yeah. get. They do a good job on him. Uh, quickly, lastly, on the Oilers here, has Stuart Skinner done enough late here to pull into the lead in the Calder? conversation i mean what beneers is doing is pretty impressive but skinner this last little stretch here johnny has been lights out for them that's a really good point and we haven't really given him a lot of airtime about this race you know yeah he he did make the all-star game right and his team is playing very well what is he 25 wins on the season got a 9 11 which is way above league average uh 284 so like beneers is having a good year and he's, you know, the number one center on a playoff-bound team. But what does Beniers have? 22 goals and 54 points? Whatever it is, something like that? Yeah, I'll check like, it here. It doesn't have, he doesn't have 70. In today's right. NHL, 50 points is not what it was 20 years ago. So, 54 points, you had it. 22 goals, 54 points. Oh, what a good guess. Um, so, yeah, like, I think that's a conversation worth having, Pierre. I haven't really thought yeah. about it that much, about who could kind of slide in there, but... I think Skinner absolutely deserves that kind of consideration. I do too. And, um, you know, I don't know yet how I'm going to vote. I'll, I'll, like all the voters will look at the numbers, talk to a lot of different people. But the reason I think Skinner deserves to be in the conversation is the pressure that was on him to fill that vacuum, you know, after Jack 100%. Campbell struggled so much this year. He's on a Stanley Cup contending team that certainly, especially in the first half of the season, gave up a lot of great A's in front of him. Mm-hmm. And he had to be pretty darn good to keep the Oilers in a lot of games, especially, again, like I said, in the first half of the season. Um, I, I do think he deserves it. You know, a lot of pressure on a young man, and uh, he's delivered. Win over Boston late in the season here in a measuring stick game. Win over L.A., shutout win, or 40-plus saves. Win over Vegas, another win over L.A., Allows one goal against in two games, in massive games against the Los Angeles Kings. He's been pretty impressive. Be uh, nice Pierre, if he could have gotten a 30. Yeah. He's going to yeah, get to enough. 27 or 28. He's going to be just shy. 30 wins is kind of like a 20-goal season sort of for goaltenders. Mm. Maybe a bit Set a franchise now, right? record last month for wins in a month, too. Well, <laughs> yeah, talk about closing strong, right? Yeah, I know. He's, Pierre, he's... will the mustache factor in it all uh, into your vote? <laughs> uh, he's got quality no. mustache game, that guy, and he takes pride in it. <laughs> it will not factor in. Zero. It should though. It should. Oh, though. you're so legit, you <laughs> journalist. You. It should factor in absolutely. Uh, All right, guys. Great job on the breakdown. Uh, still lots more to come here. By the way, red card, yellow card, no card. Let's do it, fellas. It's been absent for a few weeks here and there, but we got a beauty this week. And I actually put this one to Twitter and did a Twitter poll. So let me yeah. put it to you guys. I'll read the tweet to you. Uh, If I've listened to a book on Audible and I end up in a conversation about that book, am I fine to say I've read the book? Red card, (laughs) yellow card, no card. We're going to get to some comments on Twitter here, and I'll give you the results of the poll after the fact. 
Johnny. I've read that book. Brian <laughs> Burke's book that he recently wrote. Uh, no. I read it. No. I read it. That's a red card. That's a that's a that's a that's, a, that's an ejection. You might as well watch the movie. You listen to the book. It reminds me, I had Sergey Samsonov was my roommate back in Montreal, and I where I was leaving the room, and I'm like, "What are you gonna do?" He's like, "I'm gonna read a book." So he puts his computer on and plugs his headphones in. I'm like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "I'm reading a book." I'm like, <laughs> "What are you talking about?" He's like, "It's an audio book." I'm like, "That's not reading. You're 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 having a bedtime story read to you. That's not <laughs> that's not reading." Now you can say I had it. You know, I did an audible audio book, and you can talk about the book because you have had the information. So you have but to it, specify that you have yes. to say I've listened to it in yes. your mind, Johnny. Yes. So if I'm part of a book club and I show up and I just don't mention at any point that I actually listened to the book, you you think that's grounds for dismissal from the book club. Yeah, because the reason you're not mentioning it is because you know you're a fraud. No, it's because it's semantics. And what does it matter? It's actually- Well, that's why you're in a book club because you can appreciate semantics. Words matter when you process them yourself through your own brain. Red card, get out of here. Pierre? Well, I just want to know one thing. While you were listening to the book, was someone peeling grapes for you too? <laughs> Breaking Buddy, in his I have for to him. read so much every day for work. The last thing I want to do when I relax okay. is read more. So I listen to them. And it's amazing listening to a book, especially when it's read by the person who actually wrote it. So Chuggy. like Berkey did his own book. It was amazing. Legitimate question. I've never listened to a book in my life. Yeah, yeah, they they is, it, is it just one voice or is it done like, you know, Brian says, and the voice changes. Like different characters. Timmy says, like a character, right. or is it just no, one voice? No, no. So what will happen sometimes is if if it's, let's say it's a it's a portion where they're quoting a female, sometimes the narrator will maybe lightly, okay. you know, bring right. their voice up a little bit like this. But no, okay. generally speaking, it's one voice, same voice yeah. uh, the entire way through. I'll give Pierre, uh, we're waiting card. with grand anticipation here on you, my friend. Red card. Not a baby. Full Not red. a baby. I like it. Huh. Put it out on Twitter. Uh, Don Ellis said, it's like reading Game of Thrones or watching the series. Both are good, but the books, they are fantastic, especially book three. It's not the same. Movies are nowhere near the time commitment that even listening to a book is. Wow. Uh, Gord of Thunder says, I read this tweet. I didn't listen to it. Should I say I listened to it? (laughs) (laughs) Nice. That's like saying I read an episode of Got Your Back. Uh, I don't really view this the same way. Uh, I have absolutely no science to back this up, but I think that the comprehension and retention factor is much higher when reading. So in my opinion, there is a difference. Red card, says Mike the Destroyer. All right. That's my my. That's my tag name. I'm also Mike the Destroyer. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't sound like uh, you, actually. <laughs> you would nickname yourself. You have nicknamed yourself, Mike, on the pod. <laughs> that would be an ironic nickname if I was ever called Mike, Mike the Destroyer. What were your career yeah. hits again? Uh, yeah. Okay. Your opinions don't hole, matter. Though, they don't matter because here on Got Your Back, we have the ultimate yeah. arbiter, right. Terry Ryan, who I believe is on location as we speak, shooting season two of Shorzy, bringing back his beloved character, Ted Hitchcock. He was a little lengthy with his response here, guys, so bear with us. He made some good points. Terry Ryan, ultimate arbiter. When it comes to claiming to have read a book when you've merely only listened to it, I give this a red card and it couldn't be any more obvious in my mind. While it's true you may have consumed the book, you didn't read it. You listened to it. And those are two totally different words that mean two totally different things. You may not even be able to read and can listen to a book. (laughs) If I take an apple and I put it in a juicer and I drink the results, I'm drinking apple juice. I didn't eat the apple. I'd be lying if I said I did. I consumed it. Why am I not allowed to use my bike or car in a foot race because it's about running if someone says did you run a mile and i just drove it i can't claim to have run it because running and driving mean two totally different things just like the book you listened you didn't read good for you for taking the time to actually digest the contents of a good old-fashioned hardcover but you didn't read it you did consume it and you get some points for that but you didn't read it, that would be a lie. Red card, final answer. 
Oh, Terry Ryan, I mean, the ultimate arbiter coming over the top. The, love the, it. the juicing, I love the juice analogy. Is that's a good analogy. Consumption. I still think thinking. you ate the apple. If you completely juice an entire apple and drink that, you've eaten an apple. I'm you sorry, you've eaten an apple. Did you run a mile in your car? That's different. Okay. So how many grapes I like have I eaten too. this year by drinking wine? I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, yeah. A lot uh, of red grapes. Thanks to all who took part in the Twitter poll, almost 2,700 votes. Gentlemen, mm -hmm. the masses are with me. Full red card, 16%. You guys are in the 16th percentile. Yellow card, 28%. No card, 56%. I win, you lose. This day is mine. Shoggy, I would flip doesn't that. always mean we're the smartest. And say we're more likely in the 84th percentile. And in fact, you would be yeah. in the bottom 50 percentile. Uh, you and actually. your numbers, Mystic Mike. You can <laughs> uh, twist the numbers however you want mm -hmm. to make your glass 84% full or empty. But uh, I'm taking the W today, guys. We can all take a W. Great podcast. Thanks for doing this, Johnny. All right, guys. You're, All right. You're taking the W just like you said you read a book. I mean, they're both false. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> frauds everywhere. I read like 15 books last year, guys. I'm proud of myself. I'm an avid reader. An avid reader. I don't even know what that means for you anymore. Reader. Does that you mean avid listener? <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, all right. Lots more to come on the podcast. Uh, up after the break, Brock McGillis and Bain Pettinger, two prominent voices in the game today. We're going to get into a discussion about the NHL's pride celebrations, how they've gone this year. We'll get some really meaningful perspective from the two of them. So stay with us. Lots more to come here on Got Your Back. See you, Johnny. We want to tell you about a truly Canadian company. Cross Country Canada Supplies and Rentals provides equipment and supplies to all facets of the Canadian construction industry. But what sets them apart is their get or done attitude. It's a core value of their company. I've been to the offices. I've seen how they proudly display that on the wall at each branch. Every one of the staff members lives by the get or done formula to ensure they'll never let their customers down. They'll bend over backwards to get their clientele what they need when they need it. They don't make excuses. Cross Country Canada takes great pride in this attitude and they truly believe that the success of their customer is their success. You can't get much more Canadian than that. All right, time now for Who's Got Your Back, our interview segment brought to you by Liberty Smart Security, a company that specializes in having your back. High quality advanced smart security systems for your home or your business. They use leading edge technology to protect the things that you value most in life. Your home is your castle. Protect it with Liberty Smart Security. Visit libertysecurity.ca. Okay, Pierre, uh, powerful interview today. Bain Pettinger and Brock McGillis are two incredibly important and prominent voices in the conversation today surrounding LGBTQ plus inclusion in this game that we all love. They took some time, both of them, to join us. I know you're part of an organization that they began, the, the Alphabet Sports Collective, that was Brock's initiative. Um, listen, we took our time and we had a lengthy conversation with them, but we went right into the heart of a lot of these issues. And I have to say, I encourage people to stay with us in this interview because yes. it was powerful, man. And these guys' voices, they really matter. Yeah, I sure hope that uh, everyone takes the time and it was lengthy, but uh, this is a conversation that I, I, that we really want to have Ryan, you and I, we talked about this, you know, so much of what's happened this year with pride nights and People have their comments on Twitter. You know, I, I did it. Um, but let's have a meaningful conversation. Let's let's take our time and, and talk about all the issues. And yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that, uh, that we did this. Absolutely stunning. Got your back stories. Um, from Brock McGillis in particular, you and I were both choked up. Um, just amazing that he shared. Uh, and same from Bain Pettinger as well. But uh, here it is, courtesy Liberty Smart Security, our interview with Brock McGillis and Bain Pettinger. They continue their fine work around the National Hockey League and in the hockey world, Bain Pettinger and Brock McGillis. Uh, some of the spirit behind the Alphabet Sports Collective. Pierre, I know you're part of that important organization as well. Thanks for being here, guys. I, I know you've been on a bit of a, a media tour this year and 
And I think for good reason, this, this has been in the headlines and a big topic uh, all season long. Uh, the first thing I want to say, guys, is, you know, we're going to have a conversation about the outliers. And we know that that's a big part of the conversation is the outliers, uh, players who've chosen not to participate. But Bain, I want to start with the things that have been done and all the players that did participate. And in the big picture, as most of the Pride Knights have come and gone, What's your sense of where the game is at in the way that these things are being celebrated? Because I went over the list. The Hockey News wrote a nice article about it. There were a tremendous number of causes that were supported and celebrated by 95% of the players this year. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having having Brock and I on your podcast here. And, you know, to, to take a look at, I remember when, when the Provorov thing first came out and I thought it was maybe going to be a, a one-off, but, you know, I don't think as we've seen, there's been more players speak up and out and, but on both sides, you know, and I think, you know, human nature te- leads to, you know, the squeaky wheel per se, the, the one outlier, um, you know, when there is so much good going on in the game from a player's perspective, whether it's, you know, Jamie Benn or, or Tyson Berry or, you know, even Connor McDavid, the likes of, you know, a lot of oil listeners on this, um, you know, publicly speaking and supporting the community. So on the, on the outliers, you know, I think with anything, you're going to have people that disagree on any subject that you bring up. Um, You know, I'm not letting myself personally, you know, Brock may have a different view, but I'm not letting myself personally focus on that. I'm focused on, on the positives in the game and that, you know, Nashville last night all decided to wear their pride jerseys for the first time. The Leafs hosted a pride night, um, you know, with lots of members of the community when Philadelphia did that with, you know, the headlines got Prover off there where Scott Lawton and James Van Riemsdyk hosted 50 queer youth at the game and had them in the dressing room after. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think we've, we've shifted away from what pride nights are. And with all due respect to the players, they're not really about them. They're about welcoming in the queer community for one night to say, Hey, you're welcome at our game. And if you see your favorite player or your favorite team, with a rainbow or stick or whichever, and you tie to that as a member of the queer community, then that's great. And that's really what all the all the Pride Night is about. Um, it's not really about asking players to pick, you know, right or wrong or declare their their religious beliefs. It's it's 15 minutes of a warm-up that we're asking them to show that, you know, the queer community is welcome here. And I think we've kind of shifted away from that in Pride Nights of of what it's actually about. And it's about welcoming people into the arena. And and not pushing them away, which has has been done with the, with some statements made by a you know a small number, a handful mm-hmm. of players in the National League. But you know, there's hundreds that are on board. So I think we really need to focus on that. Brock, what have you seen? What's your takeaway from all of these initiatives that have been put forward, and, and I guess the positives that have come from all of these nights? I think for me, um, two things. Number one, were um, uh, I've never been a big fan of Pride Nights. Mm-hmm. Uh, full disclosure, I, I've never loved them. Um, I've found them to be performative. But uh, two things. Number one, we're at a place in North American society where the LGBTQ plus community is under attack uh, daily. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Pierre's kind of felt some of that, I'm sure, when he's tweeted in support and seen, you know, what comes with it. And it's uh, it's a regular occurrence. There's over 400 and some laws trying to be passed that are anti-LGBTQ plus in America. And, and we're getting some people being a little louder here in Canada, which is shocking, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, so to me, I'm I'm almost because of that, saying, yeah, we need the visibility still. I thought like three years ago, I was like, in even beginning of this year, I was like, that's 2000. Like, give me something new. And then, so happy for that. The other thing is I've noticed um, a lot of organizations are doing on their corporate side, corporate hockey culture is doing a real good job within the queer communities. Uh, they're partnering with organizations like I was just working with Chicago and they partner with an organization that helps um, queer people who were, you know, kicked out of their homes on the street, different things, find jobs, get educated and things like that. And and their foundation helps fund them. Um, we're seeing San Jose and the great work they do up there. And, and Toronto works with a ton of organizations 
that side of it is really important because they're helping their own com- the city they're in that queer community thrive and and i think i'd be remiss to talk be critical after without recognizing the really good things that are being done there yeah and i think you know i wrote this recently I, i'm not into I don't want to shame the players who are objecting to being part of it into it. I, I want, I, but I, I do wish that they'd be more open to a deep rooted conversation about all this behind the scenes, not in front of the camera, not for Twitter, but just back and forth. And if they still feel the same way, so be it. Um, but I think if they heard from, from you two and other people in the community, heck, even from me as an ally, I think that's where the work has to be done. Uh, I wonder if you guys agree with that. Um, I have these conversations, like mm-hmm. not as structured as with the team, but, and I'm sure Bean has as well, but, and structure too. I mean, I've gone and worked with some orgs where you have some conversations that are like, whoa, this, this is okay. We're going here. But I remember one time Curtis Gabriel called me and, and all of a sudden I had, um, six or eight pro players on this call and Mm. i think it was a zoom and all of a sudden we're talking about locker room culture Mm -hmm. and whether uh, a gay man should be able to shower in the locker room and i'm like oh i whoa okay i guess we're like this is deep okay and right into it yeah and i want them to feel safe that they can have a view that Maybe actually, you know, if we break it down, homophobic, they don't realize it is. It's just ignorance. Right. And then I can share stories of, well, no, this will happen because of this. Or this is, you know what I mean? Or did you think about how, you you know, like, do, do you feel that same way when you're at the beach with your wife or girlfriend and, and your girlfriend's in a bikini? And, and are you concerned about your friends checking her out? Why, why here? Why this and not that? You know what I mean? And then mm-hmm. the goal is to get people to critically think. So those mm-hmm. conversations, to your point, are happening at times behind the scenes. and We don't just necessarily hear about them, Brock. They're happening a little bit. They're happening um, not as frequently and as structured as they need to be. It's, it's mm-hmm. if somebody, you know, all of a sudden has something and then they go to one person who then goes to another and then it sort of filters over. It's like really back channeling. Right. So we've seen a couple of different reasons why players have made the decision not to partake, whether it's not wearing uh, the pride Jersey or not doing the tape often sitting out warmups. And I want to have separate conversations about these reasons. Religious beliefs have been cited on a number of different cases from the stalls to Proveroff, James Reimer. But there's another conversation that's being had about the safety of Russian players and their families due to anti-gay legislation, we'll call it, uh, that's happened back in Russia. Bane, you're a player agent. You talk to players all the time. Have you had any conversations um, with players who potentially are affected by this? And what is your view on the idea that it might be a safety issue for players whose families remain in or players who originate from Russia. What's your view on that argument as it's come up? Yeah, I can't, <clears throat> I can't put myself in, in their shoes with what's going on with, with their home country and pressures that they're facing. Um, you know, if, if that's what they want to stand by, then, Hey, I'm not one to judge as, as I don't want to be judged. Right. So you know, if that's if they're feeling pressures from home, and you know, obviously Russia has got a lot of a lot of issues going on right now, and and hey, I'm not as I, I am very neutral on that. I'm not gonna you know say hey, you have to wear this. I, hey, we're not into forcing or changing anyone's mind. You know, and and I think that's key is that we're not going to, and we're not we're not here preaching saying you have to believe this. It's okay for people to have different views and beliefs, but. It's also okay for us to rebuttal that and show that, you know, we, we are here and we're not, you know, the queer hockey community is going to be thriving through Alphabet and that, you know, to not, you know, have people go back into the closet because they don't think hockey's for them. If, it, you know, and they, where I was at, where, you know, even just three years ago, where I was combining my professional life of being a, a sports executive 
and working in hockey. And I thought I had to keep those two separate, um, you know, and, and I got the courage to, you know, come out. But if I was still in the closet now and I saw these things for whatever reason, religious uh, fear from from home countries, whichever, it, it, it may have pushed me back a bit and, and said, hey, you know what? Hockey isn't a safe space and I'm going to keep this to myself a little bit longer. And so that's what I fear is that those that are, are, you know, halfway in, halfway out or pondering coming out and thinking that hockey isn't for them, that they're getting pushed away from our great game Mm -hmm. that all four of us love here. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. I'm not one to judge, you know, home pressure or religion, or I don't understand that world. So, Hey, it's all good by me. And I, you know, frankly, I don't, it doesn't really bother me. I focus on the positives. And, and you I have think, a sense on that, Brock? Well, I'm just going to interject before we go to yeah, Brock. Go here. Brock, you can follow up after me here. But I think, you know, the Russian thing is hard because I think there are Russian players who legitimately are concerned about what's happening back home and what could happen to them or their family if, if, if they partake. But let's also call it for what it is. It could also be Russian players using this as a, as a convenient cover to, to hide their bigotry. So you don't know which one it is. It, it could be... There could be players in one camp and players mm-hmm. in the other. I mean, I think we have to be honest about that, but you don't know. So it's so, hard to come out and be, you know. Ilya Samsonov is is an example. Uh, chose not to partake last night in, in the Maple Leafs Pride um, celebrations. Mark Fraser did an interview on the broadcast where he talked about the fact that Samsonov has in recent years su- supported this initiative in his time with the Washington Capitals and that this was rooted in fear uh, over this legislation back in Russia. Brock, have you had conversations about this? What's your sense of this this angle as we're seeing it this year? I have. I've talked to some teams about it. And and my thing is, is listen, I, I will a, a jersey make somebody feel more included maybe you know that like to Bain's point that that queer person at home or coming to the rink or whatever they you know uh but ultimately is it going to eradicate homophobia or pride tape no so like and i told the teams i said if my family was at risk or i was at risk um as a straight person um I, probably wouldn't wear it either (laughs) Mm. you know like that's just a reality and and whether it is the reason or not i don't know it seems like everyone's saying well they're not all doing it um to me that could be a destabilizing tool to like not make them all do it because then if they all do it we just brush it off and go uh you know and i I don't know I, i i i don't know but i also know that i'd rather people be safe than um you know, risk their lives or be jailed or whatever, whatever the mm-hmm. law is there on it. So um, I probably wouldn't, I, I would, you know, abstain as well. The other side of the argument, we've heard quite a bit of it, is the religion end of it. Players have come out and said, um, everybody's welcome in my locker room. I support everybody. I don't want to, I'm not trying to be a bigot in any way, shape or form. Yet they cite religious reasons, Bane, for why they won't be supportive and wear the sweater and those sorts of things. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you guys have had many discussions about the religion aspect of it. What do you think of that argument, Bane? Players putting religion out there as a reason not to be supportive in the way the rest of their teammates are. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not a religious person. So, I, you know, again, it's like someone speaking on, you know, a, a queer issue that, uh, you know, I, mm-hmm. I don't, I can't put myself in their shoes. I wasn't raised that way with, you know, religion being a heavy influence in my life. Um, you know, so I, frankly, I can't really comment on that because I, I don't know that, that, you know, the Bible and, and, and I wasn't raised that way. So, Frankly, I don't, I don't understand it, but I'm sure there's people that don't understand where I'm coming from and that's okay. Right. But that's why we have education. That's why I'd love to sit down with these players and have these honest conversations to understand where their, their views are and where my views are. And hopefully we can come to a middle ground and realize, you know, those, those straight players to, to realize what the impact they have far beyond a 15 minute warm up Jersey um, to the community and the message that it sends. And, Hey, I hope to. I, I'm an open book. I hope to <clears throat> have my my eyes opened up a bit to the world of religion because that's not you know that's not how I was raised. So I don't understand that, but I'm open to learn and educate myself like I do every day within this community. 
Yeah. And 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 the, some of the religious arguments have also dipped into one of the comments I get a lot from people who aren't happy with some of the things I've I've written or said is don't bring politics into our sport. It's it's <laughs> There's no politics here. It's human decency, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you <clears throat> you want your sport to be inclusive. That's it. And that's why I struggle with the next level of the argument and the rebuttal. It's just, let's treat everyone the same. They're allowed to walk in the door and enjoy the game. I know it sounds naive, but... Mm-hmm. Brock? So, so I grew up Catholic. Um, I grew up around faith, um, you know, and and... In Sudbury, Ontario. In Sudbury, Ontario. Good Northern Ontario boy. I spent like 10 Pierre months Lebrun. there. 10 months in the big nickel I spent. No, you didn't. I did, working at MCTV <laughs> out there. You bet, buddy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Prince George and Sudbury, both sides of, uh, of the old coin there. Was it winter or summer? <laughs> oh, well, it was ten, dead of winter, my ten man. 10 months is winter, so. <laughs> dead of winter, yeah. Uh, so, to me, I... I I don't know. I look at Jesus. Okay. And I'm, I'm going into it. And Jesus hung out with prostitutes, sex workers, and lepers, and all these people that he was told by, you know, his followers essentially were bad or wrong or othered. Mm-hmm. Well, isn't that like kind of what we are in this culture? Othered? And, and shouldn't the Christians uh, or the, those of faith who follow Jesus be loving us and supporting us and welcoming, welcoming us in. But I, I, I've told Pierre and Bain the story, and I'll tell it really quick. Um, I was at a school board. I was speaking to all the teachers of a school board, and at the end, this mother comes up to me, and she goes, or this woman comes up to me, rather, and she goes, um, that was really great. She's like, my son's gay. And he just came out and he was in his forties. And I was like, Oh wow. And she's Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I tell him I love him, but he's going to hell. And I went, okay. I said, that's interesting. I said, um, well, um, she goes, but at least I talked to him. His brother doesn't even talk to him. And I'm like, well, I said, I don't know about you, but one of the first things I learned is, uh, he without sin casts the first stone and we're all sinners. Would you agree? And she said, yeah. And then I said, uh, one of the other things I learned is God decides if we go to heaven or hell and we don't find out until we pass away. I said, do you agree? And sh- she's like, yeah. I'm like, well, are you God? And yeah. she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you're doing God's job. And she's like, oh my God. I'm like, yeah. And she's like, I wow. never thought about that. And, and, and I think if we put it into context, it's, we're all the same. We're all equal. None of us are above others. And, and if we follow Jesus, like most Christians do, I, I, I think they'll realize that Jesus would love LGBTQ plus people the same and support them no different than anyone else. And then beyond that, what are we doing on this earth judging other people? As, as long as they're not hurting others or themselves, we should be embracing and supporting and loving them. And, and these are the types of conversations that then might get people to critically think. You know yeah. what I mean? And this is what we need to have. That, mm-hmm. uh, that's incredibly well handled, Brock. And you must come across situations like that, Bain, as you do too, regularly. And to keep your calm and composure and to handle it that well, um, it's, it's impressive. The thing that I wonder about with uh, not wanting to wear sweaters based on religious beliefs, I I wonder what message these players feel like they're sending by putting a sweater on or putting a sticker on or, you know, putting the pride tape on. What message is it that they feel they're putting out there into either their religious community or their family? What message are they not willing to be part of sending? I wonder what's in their head about by doing this, it means I what? And we don't have somebody here to give that side of the story and we acknowledge that. But it would seem to me that a lot of these players are also saying, Bain, I don't judge anybody. Everybody's welcome in my game. We've heard players say this, but at the same time not take part. Let me ask you, what message are the players sending to the community 
by wearing those sweaters that maybe the uh, I'm trying to understand what they think they're putting out there because it seems to me it's just simply about everyone's welcome. So they say that on one hand, but the action that actually shows that they don't take, Bane. And I'm a little bit confused about that. What message are players sending when they put those sweaters and that tape on? Yeah, I think they're just sending a message, you know, for one of 82 games that, uh, you know, to the queer community. Um, you know, I was following the Leafs game actually last night and there was a couple, you know, queer members that I follow that were at the game that just felt so welcome and included and, you know, just for one one game, you know, and we're not saying that it's, hey, we need it, we need this every game. It's just one game where it's, hey, you know what, a member of the queer community, if they see Morgan Riley wearing a, a Leafs or a, a Pride jersey or a Mitch Marner with Pride tape, you know, um, maybe that brings more people into the game, which I think is great for our game. Let's bring, mm -hmm. you know, people of color. Let's bring members of the queer community. Let's bring, you know, um, Indigenous groups like we this game especially hockey culture recently has taken a beating. And I think we need to bring people into the game and not mm. push them out. And I think that's what it, it, that's what the message sends. And I opened with that, that it's, it's not really about the players, to be honest. It's about the community that comes and there was, you know, probably a couple hundred queer youth that went to the Maple Leafs game last night and said, you know what, this team supports me and I'm behind the Maple Leafs now. And if that changes one kid's outlook on the game of hockey, then mission accomplished with the pride tape and pride jerseys. That's, that's all it is. You know, it's about bringing people in. And like Brock said, we're all equal and, you know, not segregating groups. And, and I think that's the important piece that we've kind of gotten away from here is, is, you know, um, welcoming people in and, and by players not doing it, unfortunately it's doing the exact opposite of what pride tapes were intended for. And, and I, I think to what happened this year with Luke Prokop, uh, where the fans organically organized a pride night, um, wasn't that amazing? I mean, that, that's sort of, you know, we're, we're, I know we're talking a lot about the negative and, and so on, but that was just one of those mm -hmm. moments that, 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 you know, that came and, and gives you hope, right? I mean, that was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Brock, I, I think what we hear often from, we'll call them naysayers, is that, you know, stop forcing your beliefs on other people or you can't force people to do something that they don't believe in. And I don't think anybody here in this conversation thinks that anybody should ever be forced to do something that they don't want to do. We all, I believe, agree with that basic idea. But it does create the conversation of how should the game handle the outliers. And we saw different ways that it was handled this year. The individual teams. Some of them leaned in to Pride Night on a night where one of their players wasn't partaking. The Florida Panthers, hey man, they did them. Their players were heavily engaged. Matthew Kachuk with brilliant comments after the game, despite two prominent players pulling away from it. Some teams have pulled away a little bit out of fear of isolating those players. We've had you know teams like the Rangers who were going to do jerseys pulled away from it. Teams who had committed to it who pulled away from it. It's not about forcing people to do something they don't want to do, Brock. It's about figuring out how the game should be dealing with these outliers. What do you think is the right way for teams in the league to deal with these outliers? Well, I want to start off by saying when people say don't force your beliefs, um, <clears throat> who I am, like, do they believe that, that, like, do they think that their heterosexuality is a belief? You know what I mean? And, and and I think it has to start there because we, we have to recognize that, like, and I, I, I'd love Bane to know his answer on this, but I know for me, my life would have been a lot easier if I was straight. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't choose a, an incredibly difficult road to, in, you know, living in the hockey world as a closeted gay man. Um because it was a belief, like it was, it's who I am. And I was in the most macho environments there are in the world. Um, in terms of the players wearing the jerseys, I think what they need to realize too is um, there's closeted guys in this league. You know, newer studies are showing that closer to 23% of the population is LGBTQ+. Some of these guys in the room, when, when they choose not to wear it, that's, that can be their best friend. And they have no idea the impact they're having by not. Um, and also, 
other side when they show, yeah, of course I will, the impact they're having there. Um, in terms of the outliers, I um, I kind of liked what San Jose and Florida did, and it was just, you know, uh, you you don't want to. This is this is who we are, um, and San Jose's always been really good with these types of things. But this is this is who we are. If you don't want to, you know, be a part of who we are and and our corporate culture or our organizational culture then you're on your own to kind of fend for yourself. We're not going to shield you. We're not going to protect you. And you are, and and I think this is different than Russian players who are fearful potentially of their lives. And and I want to preface that if, yes. if that is the Fair. case. But, <clears throat> you know, you need to be accountable because we're not going to sit here and protect you uh, for something where where this is who we are and we support our community, um, so I I thought that was really good, um, very powerful, and uh, really impressive. Bain, what are your thoughts on the way it's been handled by the different organizations? And listen, I'll, I'll read a tweet from Aaron Ambrose after the Provorov situation. Obviously, a, a proud member of the community. Let me get this straight. You have a player that openly declines to participate in an inclusive initiative for a community I'm proud to be a part of, and you still dress him in the game. Be better, NHL Flyers. Listen, she was passionate in the moment, and she got a lot of backlash on Twitter for that. I want to peel out the issue from that tweet. One course of action could be to say, listen, if you don't want to be part of this, no worries. No one's going to force you to do anything. No one's going to force you to do something you're not comfortable with. But as an organization, we believe so strongly in this and we're going to lean into this so strongly, we don't want you to take away from that. So take the day off. Don't need to be part of it. Don't need to be there. Don't need to be a distraction. Take the day off. Some might think that's an extreme measure. The Players Association, I'm sure, would be all over that. But that's the suggestion that was made by Aaron Ambrose. It's a tough issue, you guys. Bain, I don't know if you have an opinion on that, whether just setting a player aside for the day, fully paid, not suspended, no issues, but sending the message that this night is so important to us, no problem, you can sit it out. Yeah, I think that uh, we all learned a lot from the Philly situation. You know, mm -hmm. I think that was kind of the guinea pig. I think organizations sat back and said, thanks, we didn't go first, you know, and, and players even, you know. But I, I agree with Brock. I love what the teams have done. You know, each each relationship is different between a player, a GM, how they're fit in the locker room, you know. So I'm not going to try and say what went on in the New York Rangers organization and the discussions had, um, you know. But I agree that I think I like what the organizations have done that just, hey, let's just move on with this. This is what we stand for. And if an individual doesn't agree with that, then they're an individual. And I think, I think we need to focus on that, you know, that, you know, that, 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 that we are, you know, I look around at what, what happened in San Jose, which San Francisco over there right there is one of the biggest communities in the world, right? That's where, you know, um, a lot has happened in our community. So I'm sure a lot of the fans there are part of the queer community, right? So they're, they tie to that and they're like, wow, this is my hockey team. Right. And they still went ahead with it. So mm -hmm. what James Reimer did it, it, frankly, it doesn't, I don't look at that as like, Hey, we're, we're stepping backwards. Cause if, if 10 years ago, you would have told me that, Hey, you know what? We're going to have 32 pride nights across the league. And you know what? There's going to be five players that don't participate of 750 in the NHL. I call that a win. Right. I, I, I think that's, I think that's a step in the right direction. And we've got people like Daryl Sutter, who I never thought would speak up. We've got John Hines. We've got massive advocates. And I just think we're getting away from, you know, from the outliers and, and letting them, frankly, have too big of a say in this. And, yeah. and that's yeah. why, you know, we can get into it later. But that's why we kind of started Alphabet Sports Collective is to, to empower that community, to show exactly what's going on if they feel pushed out of the game to bring them back in and, and through Brock and I, you know, with, with our board of directors with alphabet um, to really unite that queer community and, and, and show them that yes, they do belong in hockey. So, you know, I think it's perfect timing actually with our launch mm -hmm. to show that, you know, if those that do feel pushed out by all the pride night issues going on, that there is a space and a, and a, and a community that, 
you know, is growing and, and that they can turn to to say, hey, I want to be involved in hockey, whether it's a fan, a executive, a media member, a, an agent like myself, an ex-player like Brock, um, you know, and show that, no, don't listen to that. You do belong in hockey. And hockey is a safe space. And let's focus on, you know, our ambassadors that are, are, are really, you know, on board with it. And let's focus on, you know, the community building and the, the empowerment and humanization and, and, and really get the queer community feeling good about themselves around hockey. Because it's, as we see, you know, it's very desperately needed right now. Um, to, to jump on that, in, in terms of sitting a player out, I think, I think that would act as a shield. Because all of a sudden they ha- they're sick or they have a lower body injury or they are this or that, right? And, and I would rather know who sees me as an equal human being Mm-hmm. and who doesn't what uh, if they don't hide it though brock what if they're upfront about their reasoning so they do all the same things that they've done with the announcements and why they're doing this and and it's well, not a hidden thing i think that was the spirit of what i what i meant okay fair um then i still don't know if i then then we are forcing things on people you know and mm-hmm. and instead of i'd rather see each team humanize the issue uh, prior to and then educate and engage in deeper conversation and then let people make their choices then just go home um, only because I think then at that point then you are pushing something on folks not everyone who you know works um, in a corporate culture takes p- part in their pride celebrations and and that's fine that's each individual's choice and um yes this is a little different it's team mandated and they send contracts that they have to do this stuff but um i kind of like somebody out on an island and being forced to now think instead of just act or or follow what they've been taught their whole lives Pierre, how much discussion is there going to be and has there been behind the scenes with the league and the member teams about how to handle these things moving forward yeah, a lot. I mean, I think teams are really thinking about this and probably looking to the league for guidance. Um, and the place I was going to go, because you mentioned the NHLPA earlier, I thought it was interesting. Marty Walsh, the new head of the NHLPA, had his introductory news conference last week or in Toronto. I was there and he got asked three separate questions about Pride Nights in the NHL and, and everything that we've seen. And, and he didn't give short answers he talked Mm -hmm. a lot about his own background leaned into it yeah and um you know actions speak louder than words but it it gave me hope that he's not he's i think invested uh in the issues and it'll be interesting to see what he does now as head of the pa the uh the other thing we often hear is why are you focusing so much on the few as opposed to the many who were supportive and Bain and Brock, I just want to address this with you guys really quick. My sense of this is that people pay attention to the way those who don't support the cause are treated by the game. So if you're somebody out in the community who's felt marginalized at some point and you see these players making these decisions, you pay attention to, well, okay, what did the team do and what did the league do and how were those people received? Or have we overdone it with this conversation, Brock, about these outliers? Or is the conversation about what should be done every bit as important? You, you guys tell me. I think there's, for 95 to 98% of LGBTQ plus people in this sport, at one point or another, they've experienced depression in it. They've been put down. They've lost opportunities. They've probably stepped away from the game, different things. So I think when situations like this happen, it brings up all of that. You already are kind of walking on eggshells feeling like, do I belong? Can I be here? And then you see that and you go, got it. And then on top of that, you're like, are those guys that are wearing it that you start to question are all those guys that are wearing it to, are they just wearing it because they're being told to, do they actually, you know, feel like this is important to them and, and are, are they actually welcoming? And then, you know, and, and so I go there and I think about those people first and then I go to 
the closeted players in the locker room who are now like, I can't come out to my teammate. I I can't come out there because that teammate isn't going to want me around. Mm. And, and then they go further in the closet. And that just breaks my heart because there's a lot of people that aren't living as themselves in the sport or in sport because of locker room cultures. So, you know, um, are we overdoing it? No, I think it's healthy analysis. Does Twitter overdo it? Yeah, Twitter overdoes everything. <laughs> Twitter's going to Twitter. <laughs> but, you know, we need to have conversations about this so we grow and evolve and, 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 and you know, help people, support people who maybe now feel a little less welcome, help and support people who are closeted in the game, um, and also have healthy conversations so that, you know, those powers that be in the sport can get a different, you know, thought on this and maybe what they're getting from those players. Bane? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, yeah, it goes back to, you know, just where we're at. Like, I think we need to continue to have the conversations um, Mm -hmm. for the community right? Because to, to push it aside, I don't think it's been overdone. I think it's a hot button topic in this year's, right? It's been, it's, it's let off insider trading. It's been on, we're doing this podcast because of it. And I think that, you know, we need to continue to have these conversations and humanize and educate. And I totally agree that if you go down some Twitter holes, it is ridiculous, but I think that's, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's the, the benefits and, and the, and the downfall of social media that everyone gets a voice. Um, but no, I think we need to keep having these healthy conversations and believe me brock and i aren't trying to change minds we're not we're trying to educate and humanize to say we've both been closeted men in this sport and felt that we have we you know if we come out and live our truth that we're going to be pushed away from the game that we love and it's as simple as that and i i love pierre's statement that he put out about it's not politics it's not you know and and it's not it's human decency and it's not as Brock said, <laughs> our lives would be a lot easier if I would have stayed in the closet and said, hey, I've, I've got a white picket fence, uh, a wife and two kids. You know, that, that's that's I don't want to say that's the easy life, but for us to be leading this and and and, you know, on here, you know, and in our daily lives, not defending, but trying to educate on why and who we love is, you know, sometimes I sit back and I'm like, what is going on here? You know, and I think I think that's where it comes down to the human decency part. It's not we're not it's not a political issue. We're not Dems mm-hmm. versus Republicans and we're not, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a clear, you know, left and right issue. It's, it's, Hey, I want to love who I want to love and work in hockey. That's the bottom line. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that, you know, by, by having these conversations and putting a face to it, like Brock and I, then, Hey, we're happy to do so. We've got big, broad shoulders. I can, you know what, I'm happy to go around and speak to teams and educate and humanize. And, and I think that's where, you know, we need to continue to do our work with, with Alphabet. And that's how it kind of came about was, you know, why don't we have a space that, that has this? And that's how, you know, when I first was pondering living my truth, I called Brock. I Googled gay hockey players. And that's how Brock and I met each other. Mm-hmm. Brock and I talked for an hour and a half the week before I came out. And he assured me that everything's going to be okay. I don't think it's by coincidence that, you know, six weeks after my article came out with Pierre, I got a message from Jerry Johansson, who is, who is Luke Prokop's agent. Mm-hmm. saying, hey, I have a client in the Western League that is, you know, considering living his truth. Can you speak with him? Right. So then we connected Brock, him and myself. Then, you know, it, I, it's a snowball effect that that everyone operates in this. I think we all can tie to someone that's in the community, whether it's a brother or a sister, a daughter, a, a cousin, a whatever. Um, but we're in these little silos and and we all sit back and, and say like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to speak up. But it's okay. Like we can, we can have these healthy conversations and debates and, and I'm happy to sit down with anyone, but it's not a, it's not a political issue. It's not a choice. It's, 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 it's who we love. And it's, it's as simple as that to me. And, and, and when you break it down like that, it, it's, um, you know, it's sometimes ludicrous that we have to, to argue that, but Hey, we'll keep fighting the good fight. Man. Your voices are so important in the game right now, Pierre. Uh, and I know you're involved uh, in these initiatives. Uh, put into perspective uh, just the value of voices like the ones we're listening to today, Pierre, because people pay attention when you have honest conversations like we've had here today. 
and it's getting good attention, the right kind of attention, yeah. Pierre, by a lot of important people. Well, I saw, I saw the impact the night that Alphabet launched. So, so many wonderful people there that night and who love Augie, who want to feel safe and yeah. all came up to shake my hand and say hi. What a night. That was fun. Um, I may have had too many beers, but that was a fun <laughs> night. Um, <laughs> no and, wine and, that night? <laughs> yeah. Um, but you saw the impact that night about people looking for a safe place and looking for, you know, people to have their back and to know that it's okay and they can love hockey. It, 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 like the message to me is so simple to Bain's point, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just that for me, you know, as an ally, you know, that, you know, as a straight guy wanting to be an ally to all this, ah. Great job, guys. Really appreciate this conversation. Really meaningful, educational for me. I definitely learned some things here today. I appreciate the honesty mm -hmm. and the um, really appreciated this conversation. Uh, to close things out, guys, you are on the Got Your Back podcast, which means we have to get a Got Your Back story from you. So we always ask our interview guests about that time in their life where somebody came through for them and somebody had their back. Brock, we'll let you go first. Give us your Got Your Back story, my friend. So I've been fortunate. I've had a few in my life. Uh, one, oh, I can't decide between two, but I'll, <laughs> I'll go. I'll go with this one. Um, one night, I was watching a Leafs Habs game on TV, and uh, I was living in Montreal. I was playing for Concordia. <clears throat> and I wasn't really be paying attention between periods, but there was this young guy being interviewed and he was talking about following in his father's footsteps and making the NHL as a GM. And, uh, and I wasn't paying attention. And all of a sudden he said, and I'm gay. And it was Brendan Burke. And Brendan um, said that and I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I'd never heard somebody in hockey say the word gay unless one player was calling another player gay on the ice or in the locker room. I The hockey world's a very small place, as we all know. So I got in touch with Brendan that night, and I came out to him. And um, we instantly became friends. At that point, I had finally accepted who I was. I had just broken up. I was in a three-year relationship with a guy that nobody knew about. I uh, hid it from every family, friend, you name it. No, not a soul knew, and we had just broken up. And then Brendan and I formed this friendship, and we talked every single day. Hmm. Um, it was a relief for me. I finally had somebody I could talk to about being gay who knew hockey. I had somebody who I could talk to about my breakup because nobody even knew I was going through a breakup. And for him, he had his hockey family and he had gay friends, but nobody who understood the duality and, and you know, the, the two worlds. Um, so we found each other and, and Brendan was my lifeline. Um, Brendan is the reason I come out. Um, he sent me a text one day and it said, I can't wait for the day that you're out to your family like I am to mine. And before this, we would talk all the time about advocacy and creating a space in this game and and working together to do it and 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 all these all the work I do now are seeds he put in my mind back then. And he'd sent me this text and it said, I can't wait for the day that you're out to your family if I am to mine. And I ignored it. Not because I didn't think my family would be inclusive or supportive, but because they were so involved in hockey. And I was afraid that they would stand up to the language. They'd become more sensitive to it, stand up to it, and accidentally mm -hmm. out me. So I ignored Brendan's message. And two days later, Brendan passed away in a car accident. Um, I felt like I needed to honor him, and I came out to my family right after. Um, he had my back for months and, um, I try and honor him every day, everywhere I speak, everything I do in this space, because he had such a profound impact on me. Brock, that's a, yeah, that's a beautiful story. 
And uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that, man. Uh, Bain, I know you've got a lot of stories too, and uh, just wondering what comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, I got lots of stories, but no, thank oh, you. Oh boy, I remember when I let you two, you and Pierre, regroup there. Um, I think uh, you know, I remember Brendan as well. I was, you know, Brock doesn't like to say it, but I'm a couple years younger than him. Uh, you can tell. Debatable. <laughs> Debatable. <laughs> My um, skincare routine says not, otherwise. Not a lot of gray in that beard. Not too much. Can, Little uh, at the front. I can remember Brendan as well. I never got the opportunity to meet him because uh, we were around the same age. But I remember his impact and watching that interview with James Duffy and saying, oh, wow, you know, I, there's someone that is, you know, in this game. And it goes to show that the humanization and allyship. And I think Brock and I take a little bit of Brendan in, in our the work that we do. You know, he was the real trailblazer. And, you know, and, and his dad and brother continue that on. And Brian's a massive advocate and has become a friend and, a, and a, an ally for us as well. So, you know, let's not forget that, that Brendan, you know, could really paved the way for, for the young generation in hockey to be executives. But my story was, um, got your back, was a little more recent when uh, friend, really best friend and, and client Tyson Berry was here in uh, playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, you know, I had floated around to some of my friends that I was, you know, you got to remember, I only came out two and a half years ago. Right. So publicly, I was out to my family and a few friends. But um, so I remember sitting around with with Tyson and his uh, fiance now, Emma, um, in their condo, Nazem Qadri's condo, actually downtown. They got traded at <laughs> traded houses. So we were at Naz's house um, having some red wine one night. It was the middle of a season, one of those snowy Toronto nights. And I think it was November. And, um, you know, I was pondering with Tyson, hey, you know, should I go public with this? Should I not? And we were sitting on a glass of wine and and Tyson, you know, really said, I said, you know what, I think I'm going to do this and just come out and, and lay it all out there. And Tyson stood up and said, effing rights. And we opened up about three more bottles of wine. And it was just, you know, when you're you're so fearful of, of approval and pure approval. And for a guy like Tyson, who, you know, you know, has become a really good friend over the years, but also a massive advocate that really that push that I needed, um, you know, for him to just stand up, he could tell I was teeter tottering and just say, you know what, let's F and do this. And, and, and you know what, take the world on. And, and just when it, when you have that support from people that you hold in such high regard that have your back, um, it's kind of the push that you need um, when you're, when you're pondering coming out and living your truth. So mine would really be, you know, Tyson having my back that night and saying, you know, giving me the uplift to say him and his wife, Emma to say, you know what, let's do this. And, and, you know, that, that's really what, what stuck with me of my memory. So Tyson in Toronto was a short stay, but that was a, a life changing moment for me. Incredible, man. Pierre, there's a lot of emotion on this week's edition. <laughs> Got you, but I'm not used to this many feels on the pod, buddy. <laughs> you guys are used yeah. to breaking down four checks and e pairing. So this is uh, we're hitting home here. Yeah. A couple of courageous guys here joining us on the podcast. Yeah. Guys, can't thank you enough uh, for what you're doing, uh, but also for taking some time to help us understand things a little bit better. And hopefully some people who listen to this podcast who maybe had differing views, maybe they learned something today too, because I know Pierre and I most certainly did. Guys, great work, continued uh, great work, and thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. That's going to wrap up this week's podcast. A huge heartfelt thank you to Brock McGillis and Bain Pettinger for taking that much time to explain a critical issue facing the National Hockey League right now. Just really meaningful comments and definitely learned a lot today. So thanks to those gentlemen for joining us. Big thanks to our sponsors as well as always, Cross Country Canada, Supplies and Rentals, Kuma Outdoor Gear, and of course, Liberty Smart Security. Appreciate your downloads and your subscriptions and your support here on the podcast. Look forward to chatting with you again next week. Cheers, everybody.